I am really excited about the next speaker. Uh, one of her biggest fans, she doesn't know it, I've heard her speak a couple times, including she gave a great presentation at Open Lands, uh, one of the boards I serve on, and, and um, has been shown up all over the place talking about climate. Uh, and and it's, it's really uh, refreshing to have uh, a new voice in the city talking about some really cool stuff. So um, Dr. Abigail Derby Lewis is a conservation ecologist at the Field Museum of Natural History. Her work in the Science Action Center of the museum, it's a division dedicated to translating museum science into lasting results for conservation and cultural understanding. It focuses on climate change adaptation for urban natural areas in the Great Lakes region. She works closely with natural resource managers at the federal, state, and local levels, as well as municipal and community leaders to develop place-based adaptation strategies. Derby Lewis is co-chair of the Chicago Wilderness Climate Change Task Force, actually probably one of the most active task force in Chicago Wilderness. They're always doing cool stuff. And she's also editor of the Chicago Wilderness Climate Change Newsletter. Please, work, uh, please welcome Dr. Lewis Derby. Thanks so much. I'm always excited to be here at the Botanic Garden, always excited to be out of my office. Um, I'm here today kind of wearing both my Field Museum hat and also my Chicago Wilderness hat, and I'm going to talk about a couple of things. First, I'd like to talk about um, kind of the, the changes that we're expecting here with regard to regional climate change in the coming decades, and there were a couple questions about that, and hopefully I'll be able to answer those. And then talk about the likely impacts pretty briefly to both nature and to people and then give an overview of some of the adaptation efforts underway to increase the health and the resiliency of our natural assets in order to increase the quality of life, both for the amazing biodiversity that we have here in this region and the more than 10 million people who call this area home. So many of you are probably familiar, but Chicago Wilderness is a geographic region in a sense, um, as well as an alliance. And the geography of this wilderness area incorporates four states around the southern basin of Lake Michigan, including 38 counties and over 500 municipalities. And as I mentioned, it's an alliance of over 300 member organizations, all of whom support and help to implement what we refer to as this green infrastructure vision for the geography. And this is the graphical representation really of this region's biodiversity recovery plan. So in the mid-1990s, members got together, they collaboratively developed this um, essentially roadmap for best management practices for ecological restoration that they dubbed the biodiversity recovery plan. And this is in fact the, that, that graphical representation of it coming to life, if you will. The 1.95 million acres that we see within this geography, there are 546 acres that are already in protected status, and that is represented by the dark green on this graph. And of those, about 350,000 are natural areas. And the remaining areas identified in that light green, um, those are really identified as areas that can be restored or protected or connected through conservation and thoughtful, sustainable sustainable development practices. And this connectivity is more important than ever to our species that are faced with really needing to migrate um, to keep up with their climate envelope, as Andrew mentioned before. Um, they're doing this through an incredibly fragmented and often incredibly uh, inhospitable urban matrix. And so really being able to bring a lens to what it is that we need to do to help this moving forward is incredibly important. The ultimate goal is really to restore the health and connectivity of what is now this fragmented landscape so our regional system can function as a whole. And I'll be coming back to this theme at the end um, to really, really thinking about this system's holistic um, function from a landscape perspective. And we know this is important for a variety of reasons, including continuing to provide the services um, that were mentioned earlier that all of us greatly depend on. So the climate action work of Chicago Wilderness is based on translating those regional downscale models. So what is it that we know in terms of expectations of likely uh, shifts in our climate system in the coming decades? And how will those impact our natural systems and species? So this work began about five years ago. And in 2010, the Chicago Wilderness Climate Change Task Force released their climate action plan for nature. It was really at the same time that the Chicago's climate action plan that Andrew showed um, was also released. And so that plan really prominently focused on the built environment, um, 
which makes a lot of sense. It was the city's plan, and so the built infrastructure was uh, was a big focus there. And so what Chicago Wilderness did is produce something that was explicit to impacts to biodiversity as a complement um, to the city's plan. One of the main goals of that action plan for nature was to take a really deep dive into the best management practices of our biodiversity recovery plan and to take a specific climate lens to that to see if what we were doing was in fact um, what we think we should be doing in light of new information and new data regarding shifts in our climate system. And that process to collaboratively come up with um, this climate change update to our regional plan took about two and a half years. It's the beauty of Chicago Wilderness in my mind. I've worked with a lot of different conservation organizations. Um, I have never worked with a model in terms of an alliance that does things collaboratively. It is a slow process when you have over 300 members um, and you all need to land on the same page. But once you do, the strength and power and the ability to have everybody working in a coordinated and collaborated way is phenomenal and in incredibly successful at actually getting things done and getting our plans and visions implemented in a real and meaningful way. So all of that work was based on the downscaled models that the city of Chicago um, had for their Chicago action plan. And what I'll show briefly now are four slides that is really some more recent downscale models um, coming out of University of Wisconsin-Madison, so their um, climatic research center. And this, I think, really does kind of a better job at showing the likelihoods of the extremes. So for example, and I will say as a caveat, um, and folks have heard me speak before I've heard this, with regard to models, all of them are wrong. Some of them are more useful than others. So we should just keep that in mind. Um, this is not a rubber stamp of this will happen. This is an expectation based on um, population growth, based on um, emission scenarios, and a variety of other um, assumptions kind of baked into um, this modeling system of what our likely projections will be. Um, and this is looking at mid-century, so 2040s to 2060s, and it is based on that high emission scenario that Andrew um, spoke about before as well. So previously, the expectation was this area would warm anywhere between 3 and 8 degrees Fahrenheit by the middle of the century. And um, as, a, as a natural resource manager, that can be really challenging to wrap your mind around. Um, you know, maybe you're an optimist. Maybe you think, well, what would be that three? Would that be so bad? That might not be so bad. But what is the likelihood of it only warming three degrees, I think is a really important um, thing to consider. So using this kind of probabilistic technique, you can kind of hone in on, on the likelihood piece of that. So when we do that, we see that there is really less than a 10% chance of only warming three degrees, as well as less than a 10% chance of it warming eight degrees or more. The highest likelihood that we have is warming of at least six degrees by mid-century. And the refinement of this information, I think, is very valuable um, for a variety of audiences, including uh, natural resource managers, for assessing risk and knowing which species and which systems we should be prioritizing for adaptation based on their sensitivities to um, these kinds of shifts. This next one is showing the range for the increase in winter daily temperature. Um, again, previously, that range was put between 4 and 10 degrees. Um, the highest likelihood is at about 6.5 degrees by mid-century. And then for our summer daily temperature change, again, we had a range between 3 and 8, and that looks um, most likely to be at least 5 degrees for our summer daily temperature. And this last one here is looking at the increased number of days over 90 degree Fahrenheit, um, so some of these extreme heat days. And the expectation is that the number of days over 90 is going to increase by about 32 days. So that's an additional four weeks per year that we're likely to see over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. That says nothing about um, sort of the uh, pattern. So it's not saying you will have four weeks back to back of sequential days um, over 90 degrees, but just annually that kind of uh, net increase in number of days. 
the next couple of slides, um, I hope to kind of give a, a nutshell, if you will, um, a recap in a nutshell of the types of expectations. Um, and I'm taking a lot of complex information and sort of boiling it down. So again, um, like the last talk, if there are questions, please go ahead and raise your hand so we can make sure everybody understands the information. Um, there are likely to be changes in uh, the patterns of when we get um, precipitation. So mentioned previously by Andy. Andy? That was weird. Do you go by Andy? He's not even listening. <laughs> anyway, so Andy and I were talking, and um, he was saying too, we're that friendly now, um, that the, the change in pattern is likely to be more precipitation in the winters and springs and less in the summer. So um, the idea there is, again, sort of less when you already have a lot, and um, or sorry, more when you already have a lot and less when you really need it. I think there's one slide missing here, but it may come up in a moment. And in addition, increases in extreme storm events. So both changes in when we get it and also how we get it. So this idea of, um, and a lot of storms in the last couple of years, I think we can all relate to, very typified by coming in very quickly, hitting hard, and moving on fast. Um, and those extreme events can be in the form of rain. They can also be in the form of snow. Um, and I think many of us learned a new word in the last couple of years called derecho. So this is in the form of extreme um, kind of microbursts, wind events um, regionally that occur. There it is. So more water at the wrong time, less when we need it. And I think a lot of these sort of primary impacts of these kinds of shifts and patterns are pretty well known in terms of flooding and shore erosion and extreme runoff, for example, for more water at a given time. But then you have these secondary and tertiary impacts as well. So property damage. Um, I just moved in May and, you know, home warming gift the second day we were there, our basement got flooded because um, we didn't have a backup pump yet. And so a lot of us are very aware of the property damage um, and sort of the repair costs associated with that, but also health risks um, when we think about an increase in runoff and how that affects recreation areas and potential health risks. Um, less water when it's really needed, so again, drought, um, but looking further at some of the vulnerabilities that we have, um, crops were mentioned, orchard uh, crops were mentioned earlier. Um, it really is a, a, quite a big issue, and we'll talk a little bit about forest impacts. But the take home point to this, um, when you look at all of it sort of holistically, there are much less confidence in the models for net gain or loss of precipitation annually. So we know that kind of when we'll get it will change and how we'll get it will change, but whether or not we have an increase or a decrease annually is much less known, and there's much less confidence in those precipitation models. Um, that being said, given the changes in patterns and um, the likelihood and, and kind of the events that we'll be experiencing, coupled with the fact that we totally transformed our landscape. We do not have so much of the um, permeable surfaces that we used to have because we paved over them or we drained them. So we have much less permeable surface, a lot more um, really heavy rain events coming down the pike. Um, and all that's to say is that when we do get that water, much of it will be leaving this area in the form of stormwater runoff. That means that in all likelihood, the ultimate end game will probably be a drier environment, even if we are getting a lot more rain because of the complexity of um, the landscape that we live in. So did that answer the question of whoever had asked, asked it before? Maybe, okay. Um, also, we touched on extreme heat days increasing, and then um, often when I talk about the region, I don't necessarily say it's becoming warmer. I say that our winters are becoming less cold, and that's because the main driver of average increase in temperature is being um, really driven by this average nighttime low increasing. So we're not having our evenings being as cool either in the summer, um, but very pronounced in the winter. And that leads to a whole host of um, impacts, including less ice coverage, which can have a really um, important impact on beach erosion, as well as recreational activities and development. And it's not as if all of these things suddenly happen mid to end century. That's sort of how our models are set up to talk about it. But it's not as if you wake up in 2050 and you flip a switch and you say, and changes begin. These are the cumulative effect of 
interannual and annual shifts. Um, and we have already been seeing some of these play out on our landscape. So Lake Michigan, looking at the last 30 years, that water in Lake Michigan is warmed by 3.3 degrees Fahrenheit, even faster than the air temperature above it, which is warmed by 2.7 degrees. Both of those things together have really decreased total ice coverage, so we've lost 77% of our ice coverage on Lake Michigan during that time period. Now, we did have a whopper of a polar vortex um, this past winter, and we will continue to occasionally have those kinds of really cold winters, because that is natural variability in our climate cycle. But that was awesome for Lake Michigan, mind you. So we had almost 100% ice coverage on Lake Michigan the first time in decades, and it loved it, and it completely rebounded in a really big way. So as of May this year, it was 13 inches higher than it had been the previous year. That being said, it was still five inches below the long-term monthly average. So it can give it a huge bump, um, but unless you were to have like polar vortexes, polar vortex, a series of polar vortex experiences for several years in a row, you're not really going to get the kind of uh, rebound that you would need um, in the long term for our lake system. Okay. So other things that have been changing that we are very aware of, and I'm sure everybody in this room is extremely aware of, um, is our shift in plant hardiness zones. So in 2012, the USDA released this updated plant hardiness zone map, and it's based on the average of the annual minimum temperature that was discussed previously. And that difference between the 1990 map and the 2012 map was generally about a half zone warmer um, for almost the entire US. And right here in Chicago, it shifted from about a 5B to a 6A. The expectation is that the rest of northeastern Illinois um, will shift to a 6A in the coming decades, and that is irrespective of emission scenarios. What that means is that it, that is our, quote, climate commitment. Because of what we have already put into the atmosphere over the last 180 years, these are changes that are going to happen. CO2 has a lag time in our atmosphere so a half-life, essentially, um, that it stays around with its potency and its, and its impacts for nearly 100,000 years. The majority of that kind of impact typically happens within the first 1,000 years, but it remains in our climate system for over 100,000 years, according to David Archer, who's a paleogeologist at the University of Chicago, who just recently spoke on this. Um, so lots of things are starting to shift. We're already seeing some of these play out. Um, you know, the, the projected shifts, you know, looking kind of to the future under a high emission scenario, the zones in this area are projected to probably be similar to those of western Kentucky by mid-century and northern Alabama by the end of the century. Um, it was mentioned before, aren't there a lot of other things that really influence where and how plants can, can live? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, so moisture, um, you know, and, and other adaptive qualities are certainly very, very important. But this is a, a, a pretty big one as well. <clears throat> so that's probably why a lot of folks focus on it. <laughs>